Guys, I have so many cool people in front of my face right now. I don't know what to do with all this information overload. I think I think you could call this like a quadrupod or something. We got <laughs> we got <laughs> we got four well, we got four awesome faces right now. Chris, who are these people? Can you introduce us? Bro, they're really stinking cool people, and if you don't know who they are at this point, I, I just, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. It's you're just slap. <laughs> Walking in the spirit is lit. Axe, Bible on my hip. Axe, yeah. two T, two three. Yeah, I'm a soldier. Yeah, so I them shots you. I don't miss. ATM, I get changed. Yeah. Social currency, they talk and I listen. You know we will exchange. Yeah. Lord of hosts, Holy Ghost, teaming. Demons round here scheming. Are. Dark void formless, but I know inside that yeah, there's right. meaning. God is right there in the midst. Look, life is just a mist passing. Yeah. Quote me on this i am tearing all the narratives down no no fam so these are two of our, our good friends here you know lena obviously so we can start with mm -hmm. lena for anyone who doesn't know lena lena cunningham is super cool you know her from church say hi lena hello well there you go that's that's classic <laughs> lena for you all business strictly about it and then we got ian down here. <laughs> Ian's pretty cool as well, you know. I know Ian, neither Lena or Nick know Ian, but that doesn't matter because Ian is just as cool. And Ian, say what's up, man. What's up, squad? How's it going? Word. Ready? <laughs> he, he's he's ready Word. to rock and roll as well. Everyone's ready to rock and roll. And how about y'all tell us how your week was? Just like a highlight or something like it. Lena, go. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> week was really chill. Um. My whole family got COVID last week and then I got sick. I don't think I have COVID, but I had to stay home from work this week. So I was working from home and I live at home with my dad and my brother and my dad, um, he's been in Costa Rica. So I've been kind of just chilling, enjoying the snow, going on walks in the snow with my dog and getting in the word and working on my music. So, yeah. Hmm. Does the dog go like the snow? No, I. That's why I have to take her on walks because that's the only time she'll like actually get outside. So I just put her jacket on and me, and we walk around. Word. Yeah, you love to see it. She has a whole jacket. Yeah, she does have a jacket. She needs to be treated like a princess. Right. <laughs> Don't we all? I understand at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Chris. You need to be treated like a princess. I'll hold the door open for you. Oh, I've been waiting forever, bro. This is why I haven't driven anywhere. I've been waiting for you to open my door. You just haven't. My bad. Here. My bad. Come on, man. Stop slacking. <laughs> How's your uh, week, By oh, we're, real quick. By the way, Chris, when when you said that Lena was gonna be on the pod, I thought you guys were gonna be dropping like a mixtape on this episode. <laughs> oh wait, yo, you guys got something planned for us, right? <laughs> hey, Maybe. it's still cooking in the kitchen. Freestyle. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> You're I supposed to freestyle, Lena. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I would sing the chorus, but we gotta keep it safe for when we release it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. under wraps for now. That's the way we roll. We roll. It, it's in the planning and implementation phase, and then y'all will eventually get it at that point once we're at the back end of that. So no teasers. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe oh. it'll bring me back from London. We can talk about the song for an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. <Lena. laughs> Lena, you might have to give us a, a tune at the end of the episode because you're not just some singer songwriter. But I think you got it. You got to end our pod with something. So, we okay, give maybe the people what they want. You know, we'll see. One of my guitars is currently yeah. not here at the moment, so she's That's getting okay. she's getting fixed uh, up right now. So, hmm. but maybe, hmm. Hmm. perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. All right, Ian. My well, week. Catch us up. Mm -hmm. My week was so fascinating, guys. You would have no idea. Like, I basically walked up to my house, okay, mm -hmm. ripped out a camera and filmed a little bit. And then I, that's about it, really. I just worked from home. So, very fascinating, okay? Wednesday night, go to the youth group, and guess what happens? I don't go to youth group, I have a small group. So, I, I didn't go to youth group. <laughs> so, yeah, my week, very fascinating. I'm sorry, I'm really boring, but yeah. Did not have that. Was that Harry Potter? <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just before this, I was like trying to figure out how to set up my phone in the coolest way, and so I'm propped it up on a book, and I've am reading Harry Potter right there. <laughs> that was a Bible for a second, but then yeah, she caught that detail, and I didn't. Hey, some would call this book uh, demonic. Fuck. Some, 
Mm, some. some. I nice um, topic. on yeah on that topic. Uh, <laughs> My, because I mean, might as well just start talking about demons like three minutes into our episode. But, uh, bro, like on an actual real note, um, Halloween on Halloween, you could watch the Harry Potter episodes with for free, they're like on TV and stuff. And probably about two minutes in, it was uh, there's verses in Isaiah that talk about like witchcraft and sorcery, and those were like the immediate thoughts that came to mind is like, oh, this this show is just like sorcery and witchcraft and like that's what bible times used to be like is there was tons of sorcery um and our church is going through the book of acts right now where it talks about uh this guy that was basically a sorcerer and paul rebuked him um and he was blind for a couple for a little while so i don't know interesting interesting thing we got to be careful what we watch these days (laughs) then it looks different than what it used to look like that's for sure so are you yeah. pro or anti Harry Potter? <laughs> dang it. Uh, I was like, don't make me. Dang it, Lena. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, um, in my flesh, I like Harry Potter, but I feel like the Holy Spirit has convicted me. So I, I, I didn't watch the whole movie. I had to stop it. But as a child, I'd read all the books, so. I'm not answering your question directly. I'm answering it politically, but I give it a thumbs up, but not if you're trying to walk in conviction. So, mm. yeah. Mm. So interesting. I think we need another perspective here, Ian. Oh, we need my, like, are you saying, suggesting we need my perspective on it? I'm, well, I'm kind of curious now because Nick kind of brought that up and I'm like, well, I'm thinking through it. It's like it's an interesting subject. You know, they got you got a lot of perspectives on it in Christianity circles today. So it's like, yeah, why not? What's up? Why not? What do you think? Yeah. Well, I respect personal conviction. If you feel convicted for, you know, reading or watching Harry Potter, absolutely obey those convictions. I don't know. Like, I, I think, I think, uh, you know, like music, for example, it doesn't need an invitation into your heart or into your soul, right? So. You could be playing a really bad song and it's just there. It's in your heart, it's in your soul, and it poisons it. Can that happen with a book? Yes. Can it happen with a movie? Yes. So I don't know though. It's not like I'm out here waving a wand and practicing sorcery, you know, by having my Harry Potter book as the foundation, apparently. I do have this to counteract it in case there's any demonic spirits in here. Okay. I don't know. I think, I, I don't know. I think you could take it too far. And, um, but I don't think anyone reads Harry Potter is like, you know what? I am going to be a witch, but you know, maybe there are people out there. Yeah. So I, I might don't know. be surprised, bro. I, I'm, yeah, I could be very surprised. Um, but I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah. I'd be surprised too. Well, maybe I wouldn't be surprised because I mean, that is, that's the way of the world at the end of the day, right? That's, that is the spirit of this world. This world does belong to Satan. So I would not be surprised that there would be people who would take advantage of that <clears throat> very demonic type of spell casting reality in some legitimate form, like you see in Isaiah, which is why God was commanding his people not to partake in that. But you did bring up an important point there at the end of the day, our influences do speak into, um, mm-hmm our heart or they, they indicate what we naturally desire to align ourselves with. And it's important that we monitor what we find to be pleasurable so that we don't get drawn into things that lead us away from God at the end of the day. So that was a very important point that you kind of made there. I want to flesh this idea out a little bit um, because Isaiah's old Testament, this is before his people had the Holy spirit. So they didn't have the power to fight demonic forces as a Christian does today. So, Yes, I do think there's things that can influence our decisions and our behaviors. But, you know, I forget where the verse is, but there's a verse, and maybe maybe any of you guys can help me out with it. There's a verse in the New Testament that speaks on the behalf of, can can the the question is, can a Christian have, um, be possessed by a demon, essentially, right? And uh, I think there's, I forget where the verse is, um, but it pretty much says no. Uh, Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Am I on the right page with this? Like a Christian can have, um, uh, what's the word? Like they can't be possessed by a demonic spirit, but we can have spiritual warfare. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. So I guess that's the, the question is, would, does Harry Potter lead you to have spiritual warfare? Does it lead you to take wrong decisions? And I think that's a personal conviction. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't know. I mean, 
I'm flushing out an idea. I'm not saying that's this. Mm-hmm. I think. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Thoughts? Well, I feel like when I hear Christians talking about Harry Potter, they're usually relating it to like if they were to have kids one day and would they let their kid read the books, watch the movies. And I honestly think both sides have really good points. I guess my question is, it's like, I think there's a lot better things like your kids could watch. Like the Harry Potter series are really good, but there's much more godly things they could be reading too and then I remember growing up reading the Harry Potter books and I wanted to be like Hermione for Halloween and it's like you kind of get to a point where you idolize the characters and even though inherently like the message of the book is good like they're defeating Voldemort or whatever like the message is good like Harry's the good guy and then like they're um, defeating evil Mm-hmm. I think still kind of entertaining, like the witchcraft and all that stuff tainted in there. It's kind of like you're dancing back and forth. Mm-hmm. Like I, like I wouldn't want my kids to watch that, but if you're like an adult, maybe it's different, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think there's better things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's just look at what, what the Bible says. And I think, Lena, you made an interesting point about like dancing back and forth um, because God is like redeeming all of creation. And so like he can redeem things. And so like if we're a Christian watching Harry Potter, we can see um, Harry being a Christ-like figure in the sense of he's redeeming and overcoming the death of his parents um, by evil and he's like a redemptive he's the redemptive child how about that that's that's a gospel i mean that's essentially what christ came and did is that he came as a redemptive sacrifice to defeat the ultimate evil one satan and then also the sin that taints our world and so his sacrifice was on the cross was sufficient for that and more than sufficient um you know so it it is it it's maybe that maybe there's that there's this is one of those gray things where the Bible doesn't say, hey, don't watch Harry Potter or do watch Harry Potter. It just says, guard your heart above all else for everything you do flows from it. Um, and uh, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. And so it's, you know, maybe it is from a parenting aspect of if our kids watch something and a, something pops up, um, do we pause and like have a conversation or just let it sink into their heart? Right. Cause kids, especially your mind is like a sponge. It's vivid. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah and I also think about like what Christians are supposed to do with temptation. I think people are always wondering how can I like fight the temptation, but it's like scripture is pretty clear that we're supposed to flee temptation. So if there's like any kind of temptation for anyone, any Christian, any believer with Harry Potter, they shouldn't try to like dance with it and try to like, you know, watch it because they love it or whatever. Like they should flee that completely. And I, I, I think it probably really does depend on the person, but I don't know. I, mm-hmm. Like you can watch better things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So taking it kind of back to what Nick was talking about with the, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. It's kind of along the same line as Romans 14, right? It's like you can eat this But if you're going to eat this, whether it's clean or unclean, do it with full conviction, right? Don't be like on the fence. If you're going to do it, then do it with full conviction and make sure that you don't cause another brother in Christ to stumble as well. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the basic balance that we have to have there is is people of God. But I kind of want to flesh out this whole spiritual warfare thing a little bit more because I feel like a lot of Christians today don't really understand how to attack that. And that is the primary battle of humanity at the end of the day, right? Like we see in Ephesians 6. Uh, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the forces, the principalities, etc., in the heavenly realms. Okay, that's a spiritual battle. And according to Second Corinthians ten, we have the ability to fight that with weapons that are divinely powerful for the destruction of those fortresses. And so that sounds really ethereal to people. But what do we kind of think about that idea? Because like when we're talking about influences, obviously our influences do impact our ability to fight that spiritual battle. That's unquestioned. Uh, like when we're talking about this, for instance, I we kind of brought up the issue of can Christians be possessed? No, Christians can't be possessed. But that doesn't mean that Christians can't be oppressed. Different term and different concept at the end of the day. 
right? That's kind of the idea of depression. I don't know if you've heard people say that before, but like depression, D, demonic, oppression, oppression, demonic oppression. So that's kind of ironic, isn't it? But at the end of the day, it's speaking something to us there, right? Like even something like that, depression, people being stuck in this like malaise, like this mindset where they're like, I'm sad and I don't really know why and I can't really do much about it right now. It's like, that's all spiritual stuff. And so when we're thinking about how to attack these issues in our day-to-day life, how do you think we go about attacking the spirits that could potentially be oppressing us, given that we live in a world that is of the darkness and that is a struggle for us, even as Christians. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it brings me like back to Joshua and like what he was trying to say is like, do not fear, right? Be strong, be courageous, right? Because we have the Lord with us. I think that's a very interesting when it comes to Joshua. Um, because even David in the Psalms, he comes back and he, there's a Psalm, I forget what it is. It might be 136 or something, but he is literally like talking to himself and he's like, why are you down? Mm. Like he's talking to his spirit. He's like, mm. why am I down? Yeah. And um, it also brings me back. I think it was Joseph, if I'm not mistaken, when he was in prison, there was two others there. And he's like, why are you guys sad? Like, why are you down? So it's almost like this is it's a choice that we make that can lead to depression and oppression for, for some instances. And um, if we look back to the Israelites, only two survived out of an entire generation that did not go into the promised land. <laughs> All the Israelites, that entire generation died except for two people, Joshua and I think Caleb, I think his name Caleb. And they were commanded by God to not fear and to be strong and courageous. So I think when it comes to spiritual battles, temptation, all these things, I'm not a master in it by any means, but it's where are you like, what are you fearing? Because it could be, it can be an insecurity. It could be a fear of a job, fear of lack of money. It could be a lot of fear in anything. Um, but I think when you put that over God, right. And you're putting, putting that fear over like the strength of the Lord, not the strength of myself, but the strength within the Lord. It's like, I have faith in God. So why should I be down? I know my God's bigger than the issues I'm dealing with right now. Because I think when you let fear in, it lets that doubt kind of creep into your mind and that it taints your spirit, right? You're not seeing clearly. You're thinking from the flesh. You're thinking from the heart and not from the spirit. That's that's my my guess on things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lena, you want to add anything? Um. I don't know, Chris, I would like to know more um, of your perspective on like mental health, depression, anxiety. Do you mm-hmm. think that's purely a spiritual battle or do you think that there's um, like a chemical neurological part of it too? Um, because what I think of is, I mean, I've had depression my whole life, mm-hmm. comes and goes. And when I became a believer, even, you know, putting God in his proper place as Lord over my life, I've still had many seasons where I am depressed and I don't know why. And I think David, he was depressed a lot Mm -hmm. and his emotions were all over the place. And, um, and I also think about Charles Spurgeon. He's kind of known to be, he was a very depressed man. And I'm just curious to know, more of your perspective on that. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'll start off with what Ian said, and then I'll, I'll touch on that really quickly. Um, or not really quickly, because I like to talk about things for a long time, and it's a problem sometimes. But uh, it, there are different stages to this, right? People deal with these types of spiritual battles in different ways, obviously. And generally, that does spawn from an inherent fear for us as people, generally speaking. That's why we end up finding ourselves in situations where we find it hard to trust God because I think it's been said before, but like fear is the absence of faith. They're like the exact opposite of each other or fear is faith in what is evil or what could go wrong type of thing, right? And so fear is the inherent human condition, just given that 
we are physical beings who exist in a physical world and we're not spiritual inherently. We obviously have been created to interact with God spiritually and experience the impact of the spiritual realm. But at the end of the day, we're still physical beings. And that's why it's such a struggle for people to come in alignment with the Holy Spirit, for instance, as Christians on a regular basis, because that's our struggle as people. But this also does demonstrate itself in a manner like you've talked about, like your struggle with depression. Many people struggle with depression and it's not purely a spiritual thing in this regard. It, it has to do with the inherent will of humanity being enslaved to sin and being imperfect as the creatures that we are. And so while depression is partially spiritual warfare and that demonic oppression, it also is being realized by you as a person who is imperfect and who is inherently in this practical reality that is imperfect. So it's, it's a combination of demonic oppression and our inherent imperfection together. And so it's not purely a spiritual thing. So this is the reason why not every single person struggles with depression. People get sad, right? But for certain people, that's a struggle more so than it is for others. Um, so in that regard, it's, it's not necessarily a, a physical thing. I'd say it has physical impacts, right? Obviously depression does impact your physical brain structure to an extent, but at the end of the day, it has more to do with the inherent, the inherent depravity of humanity and that inherent reality that we have combining with that demonic oppression is what traps us occasionally in those seasons, right? It's no different than any other people who experience sin in other ways, right? There are those seasons of life where those vices that we have arise and we have to deal with that. Right. So I think at the end of the day, it's a combination of those two factors, the spiritual realm that is attacking us demonically in this reality and our inherent depravity together is what causes those seasons of extreme depression. Right. But you talked about David and it's interesting. I don't know if I define David as depressed. I've actually had this conversation with someone before, funny enough, because I used to know someone who was extremely depressed, struggled with that a lot. Um, I cared about them a lot and it was hard for me to, to relate to them in that season of their life because they didn't understand the impact that their influences had on them. And I think a lot of the reason they experienced seasons of depression is because of their influences. I don't think that's the case with you. Um, but all that to say is we were having this conversation about David and I expressed that concern. I was like, well, I think that this particular depression being experienced by this person isn't necessarily being caused or rather it could be minimized if they were to swap some of their influences for more godly influences. And the guy I was talking about it with said, well, we look at the Psalms, right? And David clearly experienced a lot of these very depressive type of uh, circumstances in his life. And this is the difference I made when I was having this conversation, or this, the distinction. David wasn't depressed necessarily. And he indicated that because every single time he was in those seasons of sadness, he always pointed back to God at the end of the day as his foundation. So you can be sad. There's a difference between being sad for a period of time, but coming back to realize that God is the foundation of your life and being depressed without that inherent foundation present. That's what I define worldly depression as. It's like hopeless sadness. As Christians, we don't have hopeless sadness. We have hopeful sadness, knowing that whatever sadness we're going through, God will bring us out of it at the end of the day in his timing. And so that's the difference I draw there when we're looking at David. I wouldn't say David's depressed. He was just sad. But does that kind of answer some of the, the questions you had about my perspective on that issue? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. I feel like Nick has opinions because he's <laughs> doing all sorts of stuff. <laughs> my mind is like inwardly exploding right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yeah. First, Lena, thank you for being vulnerable to kick this off because I think that that's important. Is like um, I've also struggled with depression actually in college. Uh, like my junior year, it got to a point where um, I was in like in classes had lots of friends um playing a sport like doing all the grades yet like inwardly i was like why i i don't know what depression is but if i do know it's what i've got and it wasn't until i started to like have accountability and like and actually go to church and start to repent of sin that i started to experience the joy of god and so depression number one is real um probably every other person or who knows is has struggled with it um and it's something that that should be addressed and so uh yeah um 
I think it's it's important just to name it um because too when we when we name things it loses power on on us and we bring it to the light and then other people can come into it and that's one of the biggest ways that satan wants to attack us is he wants to keep us quiet and if oh i can't feel like i can't share that with anybody then i'm going to be alone and that's where he picks us off because it says he's a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour and so he's trying to pull off one person at a time and um it you know it's funny how if you look at uh going back to movies like the, the movie 300 uh those guys the spartan failings they were locking shields and locking swords and they were able to fight off 10,000 men from persia and so like that has to be our accountability in communities that if we have people that we can lock shields with and like bring that stuff out uh it loses hold and that's when we experience god's joy and like and we're refreshed and i think that we see that too in with david um, in Psalm 51, when it says, I mean, he just committed the the most horrific of sins. And if he did have, if he did have something, I mean, he had just murdered his best friend, uh, and then slept with his, with his wife. And he, he gets into that Psalm and immediately his response is have mercy on me, God. And it seems like there's a shift toward the end of where he, he is like fixing his attention, um, back onto God. And so we, we see that change in him. Um, and so. You know, it, it's seasonal. But. Mm-hmm. And sorry, Chris, I want to clarify something that I don't, I'm not sure if you said it, but I want to make sure because I had a response for it. Um, were you kind of saying you don't think David had depression because he always like he always pointed back to God? Like, do you kind of define depression as not going to God? Like, it's just sadness. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I would I would define depression the way the world kind of defines depression. That sort of hopeless like malaise of a season where it's like I have no hope. It's just empty sadness. So that's why I would say David wasn't technically depressed. I think depression is a very worldly way of describing a spiritual issue, right? And so depression is the word we'll use for it, right? It's not that that's a bad thing, but the concept fundamentally is different because there are two fundamental different foundations when we're talking about this from a Christian perspective versus a worldly perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you say is was Job depressed? Uh, I would say Job was being a little bit expressive. <laughs> no. <laughs> look, 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 okay, look, the story of Job is absolutely great, man. I, Job is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. Mm-hmm. Just the, imagine just being a guy who's like blameless and righteous in the, in the sight of the Lord. You have all this practical blessing as well. And then God allows Satan to just come and take it all, your family, your possessions, etc., for like a week. And then you're just sitting in that malaise with like your three best friends for a week. They can't provide you any advice whatsoever. And even though you think you're blameless before God, when you're sitting there thinking to yourself, what is wrong with my life? It's like, God, are you even there? It's like, at the end of the day, it's just like, bro, like really, like you should, but that's kind of the story that you can pull out of the story of Job as well. It's like, he, he trusted God, right? But he, he didn't have he was lacking an understanding element there as well. And that's what God showed him later on in the book, right? He's like, look, I gave you all this stuff. You should know that I'm the one who gave it to you. I gave you all the possessions you have, all the family you have, etc. I'm still God here. Where were you when I created the universe type of thing, you know? And so I think that's the story of Job in, in that regards. Like Job knew what was right, but he was, he was being a little bit silly, but obviously easy for me to say, right? I haven't had everything taken away from me, but I, I wouldn't say Job was depressed. I would say Job was, was kind of just like, why God, why? He was kind of just angry with God and super frustrated with God. But at the end of the day, what does it say? He didn't sin and he didn't curse God. So at the end of the day there, it's like, I think when a lot of us are in those super sad seasons of life, and or depressed stages of life. I don't know. I couldn't relate to being depressed, but based on what I've heard from other people, it's, it's a lot of just sadness, maybe some frustration with God to some extent from the people I've heard. I haven't heard an emphasis on frustration more so on like sadness and not wanting to do life. Um, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong about that. I'm, I'm sure it's diverse for different people, but that's kind of my general thought about Job. Yeah. Cause Job did want death. He wanted to die. So I don't know what you would discern suicide as if that's a depressed state or if that's just overly sad. Oh, I see. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, challenging you, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's, that's where the borderline is, right? I think 
the dominant emotion in Job's mind was frustration with God. That doesn't mean he wasn't sad at all. So surely when he's saying he wants to die, he is sad to some mm-hmm. extent. I'm just thinking about what the dominant emotion in Job's life was during that season. And it seemed to predominantly be frustration with God and why God took everything away from him. And that sadness was there, but in a, a lesser amount. Like, does, does that kind of make sense? So let me jump in. Um, I think Job was, and this is you no know, Nick's thoughts on the on the scripture. I think Job was beyond depressed. Like I don't think depression could even comprehend what Job experienced, and like that led him to the point of where he wanted to commit um, taking his life. And he like the fact that he even saw that as a solution shows you like his state of mind. And also, though, I think we need to point out because you know I don't know who's like on this. Ep- you know, who's going to ever watch this episode. But if you are struggling with depression or suicide, these things are real. Uh, one, you're not alone and your life does have purpose. And that's the biggest lie you can believe is that there's no hope. You can't have purpose, but that's the opposite of the truth. Um, every person has worth. And so um, that's the that's the most important thing. And uh, t- two, to think about it, I don't know that our human words can accurately degrade describe everything that happens in us if that makes sense like if if i say i'm sad i can tell you sadness but i it's more in how i feel it's more in uh what i experience that's like the definition of sadness versus saying oh that person's crying they're sad like they could have be crying in joy i mean and so right it's like we're trying to put these words to like our depraved bodies that we're trying to make sense of it this life we go through and uh there's good things that help us it helps us point to stuff but it's it's not like it's not like putting uh our thumb on it saying oh like i'm sad this is what this means i mean there's there's like a there's like a a gauge in that and i think depression's on that scale further down yeah and i would like to add that um this is my opinion um I think depression is real, and I sometimes think that God can purposely make Christians, believers, purposely suffer. Like, I truly believe that depression is my thorn in the flesh, and I think God has used it to help people. It's fueled my songwriting for years. Mm. I'm able to relate to other women or just other people that are struggling and it's also, I think we think like, oh, I'm depressed. They're Like if someone feels depressed, they're like, oh, something's wrong with me or God's punishing me for something. And I don't think that's true. And I, I think someone can truly be depressed and still use that depression and use that as material for sacrifice, something to give to God and say like, God, I don't know why I'm depressed but like we can put our hope in God and be depressed and like ultimately I think joy like the joy of the Lord will override that but it like for me at least it never really goes away but I see I I really truly see why God has me that way and I think it's for the benefit of other people and for his kingdom so I just want to preface by saying like if people have depression it's not that they're completely broken and that could be, you know, it could be like Chris's friend where it is kind of a consequence of their sin or unrepentant sin or the things that are influencing their life. But sometimes you're trying to be obedient and doing what you can to combat your depression, doing all the right things, and it just won't leave. Hmm. And I don't think someone is in the wrong or sinning in that regard, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's actually a good tie back to what I was going to say about Job. Now that I found the verse I was thinking of, it's like being in a state of depression isn't inherently sinful, but it's what you do when you're in that season that can be. And this is, well, Job didn't sin by doing this, but this is just something that we should monitor when we're in those seasons. Um, Elihu is the, the young man who ends up correcting Job, speaking up in the midst of men who are older than him, out of context, out of his cultural relevance, he ends up speaking up and what, Eli, what it says about Elihu is that Elihu was frustrated with Job, which is why he spoke up, but he was frustrated with Job because Job justified himself before God. He, he effectively 
noted that in Job's explanation of what was wrong with his life, he kept saying, I don't deserve this right type of thing, type of perspective on reality. And so when we're in those seasons, that's the major concern. It's not whether we're sad or not. God has ordained those circumstances to occur for a purpose that ultimately works for our good at the end of the day. It's part of the refinement process as we grow in our faith journey with him. But when we're in those seasons, it's important that we don't think that we don't deserve this. The reality is that we are totally broken and it's God's grace and God's grace alone that can allow us to experience something other than that reality. And so I, that's probably what I would say uh, when we're thinking about this is like, it's not bad to be in that season. There's refinement happening in some way, shape or form if we're perspicacious enough to realize it. But at the end of the day, let's not think that we quote unquote don't deserve it. Um, the only reason we can not experience it is because of God's grace and Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the only verse I can think of is John 10, 10. And it says, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I've come that they may have life and life abundantly. Yeah. And that verse is talking about false teachers specifically. And it's that's the context of it. And it's saying that these false teachers, when they teach lies, they're going to steal that joy from people. But then Jesus flips it and he's like, I've come though that people would have life and life abundantly. And that, that whole passage too is about him just being the gate and the gate to life himself. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's also worth noting, I guess, for the record, that from the perspective of someone who's not experienced these issues, but needs to be able to encourage people who have experienced these issues, I think one of the issues that a lot of Christians fall prey to when talking about these issues, at least in society with people who aren't Christian, is that we tend to think that mental health is just this issue that exists in a vacuum. And one of the things that I hate hearing from Christians in the secular realm is this idea that mental health is like the maximum level of issue that one can have. So it's like, you know, you think about this from like a transgenderism perspective, right? It's like, oh, they just struggle with mental health. It's like a mental health thing. Go get help for your mental health. It's like, not really. It's not a mental health issue. It's a spiritual health issue that then impacts their mind, which then impacts their practical desire to live in sin. Okay. So mental health issues are spiritual health issues. At the end of the day, when we're talking about succumbing to temptation, Okay, not talking about physical, unique aspects of a person, just generally giving into that temptation and agreeing with those demonic thoughts that say you're not enough, you know, et cetera, whatever else you might experience during that season of depression. So that's an important realization as well. And so when I'm encouraging people who struggle with that, that's generally what I say at the end of the day. It's like, just remember, God has a plan for you at the end of the day. And this is part of that development process. Understand that this is a spiritual issue first and foremost. And if you fight it on that front, doing what you can, given whatever your physical limitations might be, you'll be best in alignment with God as he brings you through this particular period of time, this particular season into whatever else he has for you at the end of the day, which will be two times better than what you were in beforehand. That's the story of Job as well, right? When God restores to Job his stuff, Job gets two times more what he had before. And so that's really hopeful for us at the end of the day. It's like, we'll go through the struggle, but we're going to be two times better on the back end of that than we were before. Let's, I kind of want to see you guys' thoughts and opinions on, because obviously depression is, it needs healing, right? There's healing that needs to be done. So Let's just go over the the word healing. It doesn't have to be depression. It could be physical healing. Thoughts on healing. Hmm. Uh, man, Jesus is the healer, first of all. Um, you know, he, he is the healer. And uh, I was, it's actually funny you mentioned this. Um, we just had a coworker that uh, suffered a stroke. And the um the verse that came to mind is this verse in in one of the gospels where it talks about how jesus had been teaching people in this little house and these four buddies had their paralyzed friend and they take him to the top of the house they know he can't make it on his own and they lower him down and jesus turns to him and he says take heart your sins are forgiven and the pharisees are outside the window and they're they're like 
blasphemy. Who only only God can forgive sin. What gives you authority? And Jesus says, "Is it easier for me to say this or to say, take up your mat and walk?" And then He says to him, "Take up your mat and walk." And he does. And he walks out of that place. And so we, we see Jesus forgive him eternally and then physically. And, but I think it's important to notice that Jesus first forgives him spiritually before he forgives him physically. And it's not wrong to pray, God, you know, would you heal my aunt? Would you heal my sickness? Um, would you heal my friend? Um, but also more importantly, God wants to heal our hearts and then he wants to heal us. And so, uh, you know, things like um, the spiritual aspect is God's priority, and then it's the physical. It's mm. mm-hmm. good, but it's, I- but don't hear, don't miss me in saying that it's not a priority. I think God still prioritizes it uh, because of miracles. Yeah, yeah, yeah that that reminds me of uh, I think is Peter in Acts. It was Peter and somebody. They were walking into the temple, and there was this beggar out front. He's like, I need money. Like, give me money. I think he might have been blind. And they healed him in the story. Mm-hmm. So it's like what we were asking for was not what was received, but something better was received. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think my opinion, just from what I've read and studying, is that when it comes to healing, it's all about the word faith, right? Because I think our healing could be on this side of eternity, but it also can be on the next. Because either way, right, we have a king jesus who is coming back and when we when we die we will have new bodies where it would be you know made perfect but we're not on this side of eternity the fallen side right so i think this is this is what where i'm trying to piece things together a little bit because i see a lot of scriptures do not fear be strong be courageous why are you down Hmm. why are you sad be joyful in the lord and that takes faith i think sometimes for us to be joyful. Like I know sometimes I get I get sad or I get mad or you know something. I'm sitting and I like I just can't get work done. That makes me really mad at myself. Quite honestly, when I'm not productive, I'm quite mad at myself. And then I get in this state of mind where I'm sitting here and I don't want to go to God, although I know that's the solution. And it, because I just I feel like this this you know, spiritual battle if you will. Um I don't want to do that. Like, I just don't want to take that action, right? And I find when you do take that action, it's a step of faith. It's like, God, I'm praying. I'm not feeling good right now. But God, I know you. I know you and your character. And I know you are my savior, right? Matthew 11, you know, says, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Mm -hmm and you will find rest for your souls. So I think faith is the element. It's like, I may be depressed now, and I may be doing everything I can to fight this. And you might be right. You might be doing everything you can, and the Lord does not heal you now. But the faith, and this is why David rejoices every psalm, is because he has faith, whether it's on this side of eternity or the next one. I am saved. My Lord's hand is on me. No matter what sin I committed, it was done 2,000 years ago. It was crucified on that cross. Amen. Amen. Right? So I, I think that's the, it's the element of faith. I think it's the, the, the word healing because there's times Jesus did not heal, right? Yeah. And there was times he did. Yeah. And there was times he healed and people didn't even understand what just happened. And they didn't praise Jesus either. Hmm. There was people that didn't recognize him as the Savior even after they were saved. Right. So I think it's so beautiful if you are struggling with depression or even some, you know, actual illness and you are not healed, but you still have faith in your God. That's more powerful of a testimony sometimes. So that's kind of my perspective on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's the true healing we need. You know, mm-hmm. it, it um, do you guys do you guys think that Jesus still still heals today? Yes. I mean, like physical healing or like any yes, oh, spirit. Of, yeah. of course, I think I think um, American Christianity has put a heavy, heavy emphasis on it, but he still does it. I think when it turns to prosperity gospel, that's when it's heretical and unbiblical. But if God wants to heal someone, he can totally do that. Mm-hmm. 
Let's mm. define let's define prosperity gospel. If you do something, if you do certain things, God will bless you. So like mm-hmm. if I give enough money to my church, God will bless me materially. Yeah. Um, but that can go into literally anything. Like I don't know why this has been popping up on like my like reels on Instagram, but like prosperity gospel can even get into like I've been seeing reels where it's like girls are like when I, when I stopped when, or like when I became content in God and was content in my singleness, that's when he brought me a husband. I'm like, mm-hmm. that's prosperity gospel right there. Mm-hmm. Saying like, once you're content in God, that's when he'll give you a husband. Like it can go into so like minuscule parts of like the way we think about God and the way he works mm-hmm. that we have to do something to get something from him, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. out of ourselves, like. I don't know if you guys know what I mean, but I think prosperity gospel is a lot more broad of a, like it's more broad and deeper of a term than we think. But yeah, I think, I think God still heals. Yeah, that's great. I think I would want to separate. I think what you said is perfect. I don't disagree with anything you said. I think some people can follow and believe this is prosperity gospel of when the Lord wants good things from, from us. That doesn't mean that that's not a promise, obviously, but he does want good things for us. He wants prosperity. He wants to double it, you know, like, like Job's story, right? He had to go through suffering. Everything was doubled by t- twice the amount. So I think God does want to treat us ex- like very well. But yes, I do believe like if I do this, I, Ian, a fleshly human being do this, then everything's going to be great. hundred percent blasphemy. Right, because it's not on me; it's on the Lord. I think the Lord wants to give me a blessing, but yes, it's in His time and His will, not mine. Right? It's it's yeah. Your Father, like the the will in heaven before me. So I'm I'm with you, hundred percent on that. Yeah, like we can definitely pray for healing, and God encourage us. Current encourages us to ask for what we want or the things we need or like our daily bread. God wants us to come to him with our desires and the things we're asking for, but we can't like think like, Oh, if I'm extra spiritual for the next four months, I'm going to get what I want. God doesn't work that way. Everything we get, every eye we blink, every millisecond is a complete gift from God that we do not deserve. Mm. And I think when you have a proper understanding of God's grace, like, I don't know. I don't think prosperity gospel and understanding God's grace can coexist. Yeah, There's a really great book called With, but I think it's by Sky Jensen. And he breaks up how naturally we all fall into these four different camps. There's a life from God, life for God, life under God, and life over God. The life from God is you're viewing him as a transaction, just like what you're saying, right? If I do this, I put the coin in, this blessing comes out. And then the life over God is like, hey, God, you know, I believe in you. You're cool. But like my life, my priorities first. Life under God is this fear of God, not a healthy fear. It's a like, God, I will do absolutely everything you need because I am terrified that I will not get this blessing. And then there's the uh, life for God where it's like, okay, I'm going to give up everything that the Lord possibly has called me to. Mm. I'm going to give up all the blessings he's maybe given me because I'm doing this for God. So the, he, he really summarizes this book good. It's like, these are all good things. God is, he sometimes will be that transaction. He sometimes is that, you know, that judgment, that, that rod in the staff, right? He's all these things. But how we have a healthy relationship is not living a life for God, from God, under God, or over God, but it's living a life with God. It's that, and, you know, it's the relationship, trans- it's the relationships. Like, God, I don't want your blessings. They would be awesome. Don't get me wrong. I want a life with you, Jesus. That's what I want. And everything else will follow. Yeah. 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 I've heard of that book before. Yeah. It's good. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say I agree at the end of the day. That's right. The, The prosperity gospel grips a lot of people because a lot of people don't understand enough about the nature of God and God's purpose to be able to understand that that's just flat out wrong. Right. Whether it's in the New Testament or the Old Testament, Job is kind of the commonality today. So I'm just going to go back to Job. In Job chapter five, one of Job's friends says one of the wisest things that's said by Job's friends in the entirety of the book. And he says that, um, I can actually read it. It's in chapter five, starting in verse 17. This is what he says. 
Behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he inflicts pain and gives relief. He wounds and his hands also heal. And so at the end of the day, God is not just going to give you good things. That's not your expectation from God. If if God only gave you good things, it would be him justifying or overlooking the parts of you that need to be refined <laughs> that are not in alignment with him and in alignment with his character and his will for your life. And so that's the, the, the spiritual journey of the Christian is constant refinement on our pathway toward eventual perfection and glorification in eternity by God. It's like first Peter five. Right. And so along that path, we have to ensure that we're not trying to practically over transactionalize our relationship with God. And that's kind of what you talked about, Lena. I'll draw a brief distinction there with that example you gave with young ladies thinking, oh, well, you know, now that I've done X in my life from a spiritual perspective, God finally brought me my significant other. It's like, if, if your intention is to over spiritualize that reality to that extent, it's like, you're not, you're not doing this properly. <laughs> you're not on the right track here. At the end of the day, however, that does not mean that maybe at that particular point in time, there was an incorrect motive beforehand, but there was a genuine motive change that then did lead them to have God bring them their significant other shortly after. Mm -hmm. So it's all at, at the motive level at the end of the day. That's really what the demonic forces in this realm are trying to impact within us. They're trying to get us to live according to the worst of our totally depraved motives on a regular basis. And it's important that we understand that. That's how spiritual warfare works. It's like, that's what the demons are trying to do. Get you to live in this very transactional relationship with God and act in alignment with uh, the motive within you that is inherently depraved and wants to get from God rather than be refined by God. And so it's certainly possible that there are, it's probably commonality, honestly, that there are people who over transactionalize this and think, well, since I've been spiritual for this period of time, now God has to give me what I asked him for. So God doesn't have to give you anything. He's probably not going to give you very much if you ask him with that intention, right? And this is actually what James says in James chapter four. It's like you ask, but you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. So, but that doesn't mean at the end of the day that there are people who genuinely recognize the, the wrongness of that motive. Like, hey, God, I want a husband, so I'll over-spiritualize my life for this period of time. It's very possible that there are people who realize that they did that and actually genuinely change that motive, and God does actually bring that person to them shortly after. That's possible. But at the end of the day, it's important that we understand our God brings the pain and relieves the pain for his glory and our good at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think people will refute that or, like, try to refute it by saying God doesn't, like, um, I don't know where in the Bible it says, but it says, like, God doesn't withhold any good mm -hmm. from, like, the children. Yeah. And it's like, well, what do we f define as good? Because mm. it's because I, because, like, it's like depression sucks, you know, going through trauma or, you know, like, anything that's, like, there's a lot of things in this world that aren't inherently good but we struggle with so it's like then what is god doing he's withholding good from me why is he doing that but i think we completely undermine that god is i would say insanely more concerned with our eternity and hmm. our sanctification so what doesn't seem good now is gonna re reap much of a reward um in heaven so I think that's also something, and I think James hits on it in James 1 too, um, where it talks about persevering under trial so that you can receive the crown of life. Like that's just kind of part of our spiritual walk is that we'll have trouble, but we can take heart because Jesus overcame the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's good. Yeah. Honestly, like if the only good in my life is that Jesus died for me, like I'm fine with that. Like at the end of the day, like... We really get down to the nitty gritty. That's really the goodest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> the goodest. Uh, when you were saying that, uh, there's a verse that comes to mind of this guy who was uh, the rich young ruler. And he was asking Jesus, like, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he walked away downcast. Um, and it's interesting because a similar passage in the gospel, one of the Pharisees, the lawyer, asked Jesus, 
what is like what is the most important law? And Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And these Pharisees, I guess, didn't get the picture is that they were trying to do it on their own works when it was God who is the one who did the work. And he is the one who came and sacrificed. And like, he's the one that we hope in. And he's the one we have to focus on. Um, mm. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. An interesting kind of playing off of this perspective with the whole prosperity gospel conversation and that idea. Like, what else does Jesus say in that chapter, right? It's it's really hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. right? And so I was reading through Mark 4 the other day, and in Mark 4, you see Jesus present the idea that to those who have much, more will be given, and to those who have little, less will be given. And that's just a verse that is ripe to be taken right out of context by a lot of people who read that, right? And so it's important that we understand what that section of scripture means as well. It's like, why is Jesus saying it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven, but at the same time saying that those who have much more will be given as if that's sort of a reward? That's that's exactly the, the case. It's that's It makes a lot more sense than you realize. It's like, if you are so set on acquiring wealth, then your treasure is here on earth. You you think you have all you need at the end of the day. That's where your focus is. You don't realize that there is something from a spiritual perspective that you need at the end of the day. And that's why it's really hard for you to enter heaven because you're going to be judged by your deeds, which mm -hmm. are impacted by your conduct, which is impacted by your motives and what drives you every day. And so if you're driven by cash, if you're driven by success, you're just fundamentally playing the wrong game at the end of the day. And this is why Jesus says to whom those who have a lot, they, more will be given. He's talking about people who have that from a spiritual perspective, who understand that they have all they need and who will pursue the spiritual growth path, the spiritual riches path, and then receive the benefits of that as they continue to bear fruit in their life. And likewise, for those who don't have much of that development from a spiritual perspective and don't understand it or pursue it, well, they're going to lose it. It's just going to be taken right away from them because they don't realize that's the game that they're supposed to be playing in this reality to actually attain the eternal life and that eventual glorification in eternity. What do you guys kind of think about that idea? Um, well, I do think that um, it was funny. I was reading a book maybe a few months ago called Impossible Christianity by Kevin DeYoung. And, um, he talked, there was a whole episode talking about rich people and how like all over the, like, I feel like a lot of Christians are like, I can't have money cause I'm going to go to hell. Cause it's, cause Jesus said that or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like Luke that wrote the gospel of Luke was a doctor. Dude had a lot of cash, like a lot of cash mm -hmm. and he loved the Lord. And I think it just comes down to how you view your money. Um, it's the love of money that's that's the root of all kinds of evil, not money itself. Um, and I think if God blesses you with material wealth and material things, which is us, we're like two mm percent -hmm. of the whole yeah. world. That is, we're so rich. We're so yeah. rich. Like, what can we do with the blessing that God's given us with our house, with the things mm -hmm. we own? How can we impact other people? Um, yeah. around the world and share the good news along with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. America is blessed to, to be a blessing. That's a yeah. quote somewhere. Um, but yeah, even like even King David, the ruler of Israel would have had an army and chariots and soldiers and servants. And it's like this dude had more than he can imagine yet. It was his, like sin that caused him to be downcast. So you can have, you can have the summit of whatever it is, but if you're not, if you don't have God, you have nothing. Right. And so I think that's what we have to go back to. And, mm -hmm. um, this verse just was coming to mind. I don't know why, but well, maybe I do know why it, um, walk by faith and not by sight, you know, like that's, mm -hmm. that's God's desire for us. So. No, it's good. Yeah. 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 It's an important distinction that you kind of drew there, uh, Lena, when talking about money. It's like, it's, it's the love of money. That's the issue there. 
we've been given, at least those of us who have more money, and we're in the United States, so generally everyone in this country is richer than the majority of the world. But for those of us who have lots of money, it's not me, but for people in the United States who do, it's like, and you're a Christian, that's a resource for you to go out and be a more effective disciple in society, right? God puts his people in all circumstances for a reason. It's not every single person that's going to be saved, but there will be someone from every demographic. That's my perspective and understanding. Yeah. There'll be someone from every demographic who will be saved. And that will be God being faithful to his word and that the truth has been revealed to all people, even though not every single person within their heart has been regenerated to know that truth based on scripture. And so it's like, well, how's God going to not be made a liar? You put someone who has been regenerated, who is living, walking in righteousness, not in the darkness, in that position to be the light in the dark world of the upper echelons of society in that 1% class even, let's say, to actually be that light to people who are stuck in that motivation to pursue wealth rather than to pursue God. And so absolutely, you can be a Christian and you can have wealth, you can have riches, but it's important that you are actually being the light that God needs you to be and not being like the other people, the 99% of other people who will be living with that reality uh, under different motivations and intentions. Yeah, I've been going through a book right now. It's called um, Redeeming Your Time. It's a biblical book about you know how we, first off, can be productive and efficient with our time but also how our work is worship. And the thing that came up when you're speaking there, Chris, was like Solomon, when he was having, um, when he was building the temple, he used secular nations to build the temple with his money, right? So he went out into the darkest parts of the world and gave them jobs, provided for their families with the, the money, and they got to build the temple. Right. So it's pretty unique how he used secular people to make, you know, God's temple. And I can only imagine what that impact may have had on those other nations. And that makes me think of like, I've been trying to process this is like, okay, you know, there's, there's obvious ways of, you know, how our work can be worshiped. Like we, we oftentimes we think, okay, you know, going on a podcast or doing a ministry type job, it's like, obviously I'm proclaiming God all the time. Right. So that's obviously worship. Right. But what's interesting is like, no, like you can be a welder and be a good welder. And that is your act of worship. And I struggled with that for a while because I'm like, I make all these videos for people, but it doesn't feel oftentimes like, yeah, this video ain't glorifying God. You know, um, it's not, you know, denouncing God, but it's not glorifying him either, is it? But it's like the impact you have on people outside of it. Like, you know, it's just like how the, we are Jesus's light and through our works, he represents himself. That's like Ephesians 2.10, right? We are God's handiwork. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think God calls us to work hard, right? It talks about in Proverbs to not be a sluggard. And um, so with our works, and this is where we define things, it's like I think we can be rewarded from God material wealth because of our works, but not because not because I'm like, hey, you know, I just want money. I want, I want a Lamborghini. No, it's like, I want to serve my people and I'm going to find a solution. I'm going to solve a problem and I'm going to help the world out how I can. And naturally I think that's a byproduct of wanting to serve the world. Oh, geez. Whoa. All right. We're done. We're done. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, you make what you sow. I think that, I think that is visible, yeah. you know? And it's funny, like, it just reminds me, I've been having this verse that's just been, like, stuck in my brain for weeks. Um, you know, working, I work at a church, so it feels more spiritual than, you know, working like a welder or whatever. But it can still be anxious toil. Um, and I don't know why, but I, I think it's Psalm 127. Um, and it says, um, it's a Psalm from Solomon, but it says, um, you rise up early and go late to rest eating the bread of anxious toil, mm -hmm. or it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest eating the bread of anxious toil for he gives his beloved sleep. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also not their variable too, is like, we can work, but like God also does call us to rest too. And we can be disobedient if we're not resting too. 
Absolutely. And even Solomon that literally had everything was the richest man ever. He understood that too, that like we can be anxiously toiling and just working our tails off and thinking like, oh, we're doing God's work, even in the church, like me working at a church, like if I'm working like crazy and, you know, like that can still, I can be disobedient technically in that because I'm not resting mm-hmm. like God calls me to do. So hmm. that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. You look like you're going to, I was just, huh? I mean, I was just going to. Oh, okay that's just that's fascinating to to think of that i don't think we view sleep in that sense and you know god gave us rest to combat to combat Mm. depression to combat anxiety to combat hopelessness i mean there's something about taking a 20 minute nap where it's like it resets your your mood and then actually sleeping i mean we're laying uh the, the scriptures talk about the uh, when we lay on our bed, God searches our hearts and, um, you know, they're like there's something there that that's happening that I, I don't know if we, uh, have gotten into it of like what's spiritually going on and like, and, and rest. And, you know, then you get into dreams and visions and like God can speak, um, because maybe when we're actually sleeping, we're willing to listen because all throughout the day, our ears aren't there. And so, Wow. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. I even think powerful. about uh yeah, I even think about um Jesus too. Because Jesus, he was a busy man, but he also was God. Mm-hmm. We have to remember that. Yeah. But like dude yeah. still got uh okay, I don't want to refer to Jesus as dude. Let me reframe that. Like Jesus <laughs> still got Jesus still got up early in the morning to pray with the mm-hmm. Father. Mm-hmm. And he was the busiest man alive, probably. Um mm-hmm. So sometimes rest can look like sleeping, but it also sometimes can look like spending time with God. Mm -hmm. There's a very unique way in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah just got done. And if you guys maybe maybe remember the story, he had all the the priests of Baal. um, You know, they're like, he's like, yo, if your king, if your God is real, then make it set fire, right? Basically has all the priests killed because they couldn't do it. But then he flees from Jezebel. And he's in the wilderness and he is just like tired. And also in like, he's downcast. He's like, God, like I've done all this for you. And yet they want to kill me. Like what the heck? And it picks up in first 19 and he's sleeping. And the, the one thing God tells him to do here. And uh, let's see what verse is it here. Um, yeah. Yeah. An angel comes in verse five and it says all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he gets up and eats and goes back to bed. And then the same thing happens again. Get up and eat. It's like, huh, fascinating. All he had to do was get up and eat. And then it continues in the story where the Lord speaks to him um, through the Spirit in a really cool way. But, yeah, there's another really good book out there. So right now I'm reading Redeeming Your Time, which I find is um, it helps with people that are stuck in the sluggard type side. But there's the other side, too. Um, that you kind of relate with where you're in this chaos of a hurry all the time and you need a biblical reset of rest. And so it's the elimination of hurry. I forget who makes that one. Uh, The ruthless elimination of hurry. And that one's a great one of finding a biblical balance of rest and how like the day of the Sabbath is a commandment, right? It's made for us. So um, there's things like that, but that's all. That's my two cents on, on the pin. So, yeah, we lost gonna, somebody. Where did Nick go? We lost Nick. <laughs> Nick decided to take <laughs> off early. No, I, <laughs> like, he's, his internet probably dropped. He'll probably be back soon. He's like, <laughs> speaking of rest, guys, I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah. Right. If, if, if he right. leaves and he doesn't come back, we're blaming it completely on you, Ian. This is going to be completely <laughs> your fault. Ian, this guy, I'm sick and tired of him. He's done. No. <laughs> Dude, too many good ideas you're spreading right now with about rest. So <laughs> everybody is. So it's it's great, but. Yeah. Yeah. But Hey, it's important at the end of the day, right? You need to recuperate so you can actually be up and active to be out in the world living on mission. And so it is important that we do get that rest. Uh, Hebrews three is a good chapter where you do kind of see that call, right? Enter into God's rest today. Um, and it's important that we do that by first and foremost, being obedient, right? That's what you see in that chapter. It's like the, the Israelites at that point in time were unable to enter God's rest uh, because they were disobedient to God. It's like they weren't seeking to operate in alignment with his truth. Mm-hmm. And so that's the fundamental 
prerequisite for entering God's rest. You also see that in second Chronicles 14, when we're talking about King Asa, right? King Asa, um, and the nation of Judah, I want to say at that time, who's he with the king over, they, they sought God and therefore he gave them rest. And at that point in time, that led to him doing a lot of other practical things to align himself best mm-hmm. in that season with that rest, right? So his rest also involved or being in God's rest for him and the nation of Judah at that time also involved doing practical things to revitalize their spiritual well-being, if you will. For them, it was practical. Uh, during that season of rest, King Asa and Judah, uh, at the end of the day, or at the beginning of the day, it's like, ah, <laughs> take us back. He's back. Oh my goodness. Look at you go, bro. Did your computer <laughs> phone? Yeah, sorry, right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was. Plug it. We were just. Uh, I thought it was. Plug we're it like, he's plug resting right now, guys. <laughs> yeah. God put me to rest. <laughs> he put you to rest. <laughs> oh, my word. Yeah. Hey, tilt it uh, this way. There you go. Ah, nice. <laughs> cute. Oh, look at the I love oh, this. Word. This face is huge. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, oh my weird. gosh, this is this, this is, is gonna... amazing. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah, you're gonna have to keep it that way though for editing purposes. But anyway, as I was saying, uh, yeah. So during that season, uh, Ace is actually doing practical things during his season of rest. One of which is getting rid of all the demonic idols that are in the kingdom of Judah at that time, and then uh, fortifying the walls of of Judah as well. And so I kind of like to think about the spiritual sort of allegory of that reality that we see there, which is kind of like, well, when you're in God's rest, that's a season of rejuvenation spiritually. What does that look like? Assess your influences, get rid of the ones that are not bringing you closer to God and simultaneously build up the guard spiritually of your faith in your mind, right? So be in the word, be revitalizing those spiritual walls so that whenever the next challenge comes, you'll be fortified and ready for it. I think later on in that chapter in second Chronicles 14, Judah ends up going to war. And because they were in that season of rest for a little bit, God was uh, obviously having his favor over them and they were in alignment with him such that Asa says, Hey Lord, (laughs) you're the only one who can win the battle for us here. Please go out and do that. Their army, by the way, is outnumbered almost two to one against the, the military that they're going against. And God gives them victory, right? So at the end of the day, it doesn't just because we get God's rest doesn't mean there won't be battles to come. Kind of, again, fighting off that prosperity gospel notion, right? It's like battles will come. But the question is, are we going to be ready to fight them? And we should be because we should be maximizing God's rest uh, in that type of way when those seasons of rest come. Yeah, it's great. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen, amen. Well, that's a good conversation, y'all. I think we gave the people a a ton of good stuff to to Mm -hmm. think about. It was a great discussion. I was very pleased with the amount of depth we got into. Man, this was good. I I didn't know y'all were this smart. I did, but that's why. That's a story for another time. Oh, (laughs) always funny. I I had no clue where it was going to go. I thought we were going to be talking about Leviticus, and I was scared. (laughs) Because that's Uh, what I was reading. I was like, I don't want to talk about Leviticus right now. (laughs) <laughs> and we're gonna put a solid pause oh, button yeah. on that reality if that no, was the right. Talk about Leviticus, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. we love Leviticus around these parts. But you know what? We love more at this moment in time a good exhortation. So if y'all had to leave the people with one piece of advice before we shut down for today, what would it be? Just briefly, have faith. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, get some rest. <laughs> and, and do everything you've just been told by these three. Do all of that. Um, understand the spiritual battle that you're fighting. Enter into God's rest so you can appropriately fight that on a regular basis. And you'll see the benefit to be gained from doing that. And to the development of your spiritual um, stability, if you will in your own life after you start pursuing that in your own life in a genuine manner. None of this fake transactional. If I'm spiritual, then you'll give me no, just do it straight up as if that is the one thing that you should do, regardless of anything in your life practically improves on your time. Everything happens in God's time. I think with that, we can leave the people there. Good episode, y'all. Thank you all for listening to this episode. Uh, if you enjoyed it, well, let us know. We do like that feedback. Hopefully you did. We got two fun guests on today's episode, so more thoughts to go around. More merrier times, whatever that means. <laughs>
But until next week, thank y'all for listening. And we'll see y'all then. Let's Take care. Go. Peace out. Praise the Lord. Spirit letting people driven, that's just how it is. I stay standing in the pocket, ain't afraid to take the hits. I'm an operator under spirit, cover moving slick. Ain't no tricks, this a treat. Sweet like cocoa with a mix.